This is the fastest growing refugee crisis in Europe since World War II, said Filippo Grandi, the UN's High Commissioner of, uh, for Refugees. My name is Susanne Hoop, and I welcome you to this talk on behalf of Population Europe and the Wilner Project. We'll focus today on how the EU addresses this situation. The member states just activated the Temporary Protection Directive, and we'll start to our talk by looking at this specific directive, and we'll also add some perspective from our project, the Wilner Project, uh, which has a focus on vulnerability, hence the name. And lastly, we will look back at the refugee movements in 2015 and see what we can learn or maybe already have learned from that situation to address the current situation. But before, please let me give a short introduction to our speakers. Uh, we have uh, first Kari Sofa, who is the head of migration unit at the Red Cross EU office. Before that, she was working for more than a decade in various positions at PICUM, the platform for international cooperation of un on undocumented migrants, and most recently as its deputy director, and before that as senior advocacy officer on EU migration policies. Also on board is Michael Kegels, who is the Director General of FEDASIL, Belgium's federal agency for the reception of asylum seekers. He has been working in this field for more than two decades, for example, by managing reception centers in Belgium. So we are very much looking forward to his perspective as part of a state agency that has to implement the Temporal Protection Directive. And when it comes to said directive, we are very glad that Hannah Bylens is on board, who will share her knowledge. She is director of Think Tank Migration Policy Institute Europe. And before her current position, she worked as lead managing consultant for ICF consulting with a focus on asylum and migration policy. Coming to Martin Wagner, who wrote a text that was very helpful for me to achieve a better understanding of the directive. Martin is senior policy advisor for asylum at the International Center for Migration Policy Development uh, with a focus on European and international refugee law. And he's also involved in traffic, which is a Horizon, Horizon 2020 project, just like Wolner. The fifth person on our panel is Zeynep Yanashmayan, who leads the migration department of the Decium Institute, the German Center for Integration and Migration Research. And just recently, she worked as senior research fellow and coordinator of the project, The Challenges of Migration, Integration and Exclusion of the Max Planck Institute for Social Anthropology in Halle. And last but not least, let me introduce Luc de Boeuf. He's head of the research group in the Department of, of Law and Anthropology, also at the Max Planck Institute in Halle. And he's the scientific coordinator of the Wilner Project. Luc, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, I thought I would just maybe say a, a very quick word uh, on the Vener project, knowing that I direct you to our website, uh, www.vener.eu, if you'd like to have a bit more information on what we're doing. Uh, but basically, our, our project starts from a very simple uh, observation, which is that vulnerability has become a very popular notion uh, in the policy discourse, especially at EU and UN level. And what we do with all the Vilner partners that are located in eight different countries uh, is to look at how uh, this uh, general focus, which we find uh, in the policy discourse, is actually translated on the ground. And we do that through an analysis of domestic legislation, administrative guidelines at domestic level, and the practices at state of state actors, uh, which we combine with a study of how uh, migrants experience uh, these practices and how they adapt uh, their uh, behavior in consequence. So that was the Wiener project in a nutshell. And that explains to you, I guess, uh, why we thought it would be interesting to uh, connect uh, this kind of research we've been doing uh, for more than two years now, the findings we've had uh, so far uh, with the uh, current uh, situation uh, in Ukraine and the uh, unseen uh, influx of, of people uh, that it is uh, generating now. 
but the floor is to you, Suzanne. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, the temporary protection directive uh, has been adopted at the beginning of the 2000s after the war on the Balkan, but it has not been activated since up until a few days, actually, more or less. So probably most people didn't even know it existed until a few days ago. ago. So, um, Hanya, you conducted a study on this directive in 2016 and are an expert on this. So maybe you can give us a bit of background. What is this directive? What does it mean? Yeah, thank you, Susanna. And thank you very much for the invitation to this uh, webinar. Uh, I think there's some interesting questions to be asked. Um, you know, what does it entail? And maybe also why? Uh, has been activated now and what are some of the, the strengths and weaknesses of this. So um, the temporary protection directive foresees the granting of, of immediate protection uh, to all those who it applies to. Um, it does that without having to uh, go through an individual asylum procedure, which is otherwise very time consuming. And it does so for a duration of, for the moment, one year. It can be extended up to three years uh, with a range of procedures. And then at the same time, there's a, uh, a list of uh, rights that are, are associated with that and are um, applicable across the EU. So think of the right to work, the right to education, access to healthcare, those kind of uh, elements. Um, and then it also sets down like a kind of minimum set of rules as to who it applies to. So, um, in, but the member states can also expand that further. So for the moment, it's eligible to all Ukrainians um, uh, you know, Ukrainian nationals who were in the country on the 24th of February, um, also those with international protection or a national protection status, and those with a permanent residence permit, but who cannot uh, be returned to their third country. And maybe if we think about the why now, as you said, I think it was adopted in 2001. Uh, many thought it was a directive that was already in the morgue because the EU Pact on Migration had foreseen something else. But we have a very similar situation as to the context in which it was uh, designed. Think about um, the fact that there's a war being waged on the European continent. We have a large influx, as you just referred to, uh, and there's a rapid buildup of pressure on reception uh, systems. So, and we already saw that very different countries came up with different kinds of measures. Hungary, triggered national temporary protection, Spain changed their laws to access the employment, uh, the labor market. And so this is something, but another maybe fourth dimension is that um, there's a solidarity mechanism foreseen within the directive, and that comprises of two components. On the one hand, we expect member states to indicate how much capacity they have in terms of how many people they want to host. And there's also an expectation that um, the displaced person themselves would be dispersed across the EU. And so before it was activated, we already saw these two components uh, being uh, realized in practice. We had public statements even before the invasion of Poland saying we'll host one million, Romania half a million, but we also see that there's a dispersal because of this visa-free uh, regime. And so it's a very flexible instrument which allows the current situation to be reinforced or even strengthened. And so that's the pros of it. Uh, also the fact that it removes the pressure on the asylum systems, uh, but there's a downside uh, to this. Um, the, 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 the problem is that, yes, people have direct access to protection, but now the responsibility is shifted to the local authorities, and I'm sure Michael Cahill's uh, will talk about that. A second thing is that if people would have to stay, you postpone the pressure on your asylum system, because then Ultimately, after one, two or three years, these people have to enter the asylum system eventually. And a third one, which I think many of us have picked up, is that now, and I'll end with that, it's just there's a kind of a perception um, that's being generated in, in social media and other places of a two-tier asylum system where there's a particular group that has an advantage over others. And I'll end there. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um... So you already mentioned pros and cons, and I remember the text that Martin wrote, uh, and he uh, said there that it's good to activate the um, directive, not because it's the best instrument, but because it is the only one available right now, which also sounds like he has some pros and cons. 
Uh, Martin, maybe you can add on that, on what Hannah already said, and maybe elaborate a bit. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you for the invitation. And um, yeah, also for, for organizing this webinar, I think one of the things that that we see right now is uh, there's a lot um, information needed. And I think we also need it across uh, countries. Uh, I think it's a bit, um, Hani already indicated to it. It's um, at the moment, um, the, the Commissioner Council uh, did their, their, their thing and, and now the member states need to, to come up with, um, with their responses. Um, and I, I also think, uh, just a few general remarks. I mean, there, there are limited possibilities to influence the war, uh, but uh, what we can, must, and should do is to, to provide protection to those who are fleeing. And um, Hanne already indicated this also. Um, this should not only apply to this uh, refugee situation, but actually to, to all refugee situations. Uh, and probably one more word, what, what I find particularly um, staggering in the moment is, um, we, we hear a lot about uh, the numbers and we read them the whole time <clears throat> and um, just picking out uh, that in Poland now within two weeks 104 million people arrived uh, and just to put in perspective the largest city of Poland is Warsaw with 107 million and uh, the second largest cities um, um, uh, Lodz and Krakow they have around 750,000 people so this is quite um, it's very significant and it shows already all the needs that come up thereafter housing um, it is a city basically if you if you think about uh, uh, the dimensions accommodation um, schools um, a lot yeah and i think also this is also something with with this uh, mass influx directive how it's often called uh it's there are individuals behind these uh, numbers behind these big numbers and at the moment we see a lot of children women elderly um who have um, very specific needs uh very specific questions and um i think there's a lot of of uh, need to to provide consultations and everything um now, but in how far does the, the directive help here? And, and uh, I will pick mainly on, on points that Hani already uh, introduced uh, before. Uh, on the positive side, and indeed I see both positive side and negative side, and there is actually quite um, uh, an exchange at the moment already happening um, where the pros and cons are about such a, such a directive. But I would like to, to start with one thing that, that I find um, very important, and this is this EU-wide uniformed approach. I think this is, um, this is uh, quite exceptional, uh, and I think it must be highlighted. Um, um, and we also saw, and, and Hanne also indicated already, the need is there for, for member states to have a tool uh, to, to provide ad hoc uh, uh, status or protection to those coming. And immediately you saw the countries uh, that were first um, um, received uh, people from in Poland, Slovakia, they all immediately um, looked for some temporary, uh, national temporary solutions. Um, and I think uh, the signal that uh, that uh, you white we do in we do the same thing here and we activate this temporary protection directive. I think this is an important one. The second point that I would that I, that I would mention is um, uh, this unbureaucratic uh, part. Um, this has not only po uh, positives, but it will also have a negative consequence. I will come back to that later. Um, so in in essence, uh, yeah, there is no procedure. There is uh, an immediate uh, way that the people that people come have the security and the knowledge that they have a legal status and this is very important for those who arrive uh, because this is actually what um, what i had in the, in the past few days uh, the first question uh, can i stay here and how long can i stay here and what does it mean um, and um, there's also another thing that that i see there is a bit of a, of a of a questions already do i need refugee status do i need apply and so this is this, these are questions that are important but they can be solved rather quickly um, the immediate access to services, I think, is a very important one um, that um, that you have the possibility and immediate access to healthcare, labor market, education. Um, the usual way is an asylum application. You're an asylum applicant during the procedure. You 
depends a bit on the country, but you are not have full access to all the services. So this is something um, which is a, a good uh, good thing and uh, uh, that the directive can do and did. Then uh, my fourth point would be, and this is something that um, that I had not in mind at all when when I when I when there was uh, the the idea of, of initiating this when I, when it came up that the directive will be uh, triggered, uh, this free choice um, um, element that is there, and um, that uh, practically those covered by the directive can actually choose uh, the country where they want to go to and. Uh, and here we see something that uh, that we advocate in, in in research and policy quite a lot: uh, the importance of networks. And uh, you mentioned that I also work on the traffic project. This is something where we what we investigate a lot there: the, the importance of network and how they um, can be instrumental to help people to arrive and to have the first steps in the country. Um, and uh, on the negative side, I will uh, mention also a, a few points and my first point would be um, it is quite of an uh, experiment and uh, this is something um, that I think we need to to realize it has never been triggered it was already mentioned by Hanne um, actually the triggering thing is I think many always said this is triggering part would be the, the the most crucial and difficult one to get this majority of, of vote in the council and everything but actually now we see that the, 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 the more crucial part follows right now how and what do member states do to respond to this uh, temporary protection how they uh, roll it out at national level um, and um, there I think it's, it's it's quite an experiment to start with a with this insecurity in a time when we need actually well-established and functioning processes. So this I would see as a risk, but um, I'm very confident that, that states will do their best to do that. On the negative side, and this is also quite a discussion around the framing, um, this kind of protection is temporary. Uh, this is something as, uh, uh, is um, a, a difficult one. We see it from the past experience that we have um, from Yugoslavia, the, the temporariness of, of the initiatives um, were not really temporary, uh, but the protection status indicates a kind of expectation it would be temporary. Uh, but it has also some indications on, 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 the, on, on the scope of the directive because you have immediately access to all the services like labor market but does it work with the with the um, uh, labor market that you only have a temporary status will employers invest will um, uh, um, um, their education everywhere is there this this long perspective enough there so there are thing, things that i think we need to discuss already um, ready right now um, my fourth point on the negative side would be also the solidarity uh, thing, um, not necessarily as a negative point, but um, also something that is a bit of, a, of, a, of an experiment. We don't know yet how it will rule out. Is the relocation from the first uh, countries or not? Um, uh, all we know is that uh, there will be a coordination, migration, preparedness and crisis management network. Um, and my final point, um, uh, I would I would say, and um, I, I would echo a bit what uh, what Hannes said before. Also, um, the temporary protection uh, is now for a specific group, uh, and this means also a kind of singling out of of people arriving right now from from people from from Ukraine. Um, but at the same time, we also have uh, other uh, crisis uh, regions uh, where people also come to the EU and they also need our attention. We should not forget those and we should not start with uh, um, indicating double standards in refugee protection. So this would be my, my, my quick points. Thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, I think now we have all have a basic understanding. Um, I'd like to uh, add one organizational remark for our audience. You may um, use the Q&A function, which you find on the bottom of your screen to ask questions to our, uh, our experts. And uh, now I'd like to ask Michael Kegels, um, which challenges uh, you see ahead for authorities, for reception centers, and for practitioners on the ground? We already heard that there are some specific uh, yeah, challenges ahead. Thank you, Susanna. Um, and thank you also, Hannah and, uh, and Martin. Um, well, 
we can say, I think, from uh, as as as, a, as an agency that is responsible for the reception of asylum seekers, that um, um, giving initial shelter to uh, to people from Ukraine uh, who who enter Belgium is 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 quite a challenge. Uh, it's it's uh, reinventing um, um, a whole new system. Um, the numbers of people arriving is is quite unseen. Uh, even uh, compared to Poland and Hungary and uh, Slovakia, um, uh, not comparable, but at the moment, but 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 the flows are 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 are, um, are rising. Um, and so, um, one of the first things uh, I think we did uh, on a political level was really a call to civil society and see uh, what kind of help could be given there. Um, and it's a little bit in line also with what um, what uh, what Martin said is the importance of networks of the diaspora. Which is already in the country, um, and it was also it, it, that's that's one element. But it's also the other element is really trying to to get a grip on or to um, um, to activate also the goodwill that there is in civil society. Um, so we got a call. We got we got uh, an input from uh, civilians, uh, cities, organizations, local communities, etc., offering um, or willing to help. This is. This was a first step. Second step for us was to see well, well, what is our what is our role in 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 the whole management of 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 this flow? Uh, um, we, as a reception agency for let's say between brackets regular asylum seekers, don't see ourselves as a responsible authority to also give shelter throughout um, their stay in Belgium or until the moment they find uh, individual housing. So there. Um, we're really working towards uh, a system where provinces, um, cities, uh, organizations can take up a more important role in housing in a sort of intermediate phase, in housing um, those people just until uh, they get they get a shot at, to get a, they get a chance to rent something on the on the local on the local housing market, which will not be be easy. But this is. This is the next thing, and the role we see for ourselves uh, at this moment is is initial reception, uh, trying um, to house um, those people for one night, two nights, uh, in reception centers, and passing them them through um, to um, the regions, uh, the provinces, etc. Which is completely new, also for us. Uh, um, we're a we're a federal country. We're a rather complex country, as as you might know. Um, but everything concerning asylum is rather simple in Belgium. This is a federal um, um, competence uh, with federal reception centers throughout the country um, or at local level, but financed by the federal level um, with uh, the regions having a, a responsibility rather in the field of integration, housing, uh, um, uh, integrating the labor market, etc. Now, for the first time, really trying to give a role and a very important role to the regions, the provinces, also in in housing, dispatching uh, of people, and that's that's what we're building up right now. So this is a little bit the the, the high level picture. I, I, where we at? So, so at the moment, um, we have um, a new building that that we that we opened in the center of Brussels um, to try to register uh, there the people. And to dispatch, uh, register is by the aliens office. Dispatching is by uh, uh, by my agency, by Fedazil, towards local uh, local authorities or or uh, civilians, um, people arriving, and people for whom we don't find uh, a place for the night will be housed um, in in reception centers managed by um, by Fedazil. But this is really the the crisis phase. Uh, what we're developing now is trying to see if we can also create hubs with uh, big uh, uh, reception capacity in the provinces, in the regions, and that can really function also as hubs where we can um, send people to from Brussels uh, towards those hubs managed also by the local regions. And that can then can be an intermediate phase towards um, local cities, local communities, et cetera. So this is the thing that is being um, built up um, at, uh, at the moment. What we see is that um, at the moment, around 
50 to 60 percent of the people arriving don't need um, accommodation offered by by federal or let's say the Belgian state or civil society. They have their own solution, and that's a little bit in line with with, with what Martin also said: the importance of diaspora, the networks. Uh, a lot of people entering have solutions um, because they were in contact with family, relatives, friends, etc. Um, for a number of other people. Uh, there we are um, trying to uh, to seek in first instance uh, accommodation, second instance that's being built up and normally next week that should be uh, in order um, within uh, within the regions. But the big the big the big challenge this is crisis reception. The big challenge is well how to get uh, structural accommodation um, for uh, for these people, how to give uh, housing, schooling, etc. One of the other things. We see also an, um, one of the, I don't know if it's a negative uh, effect of the, of, the, of the directive, but we see also a number of third country nationals uh, arriving from Ukraine in Belgium who don't fall under, um, under the scope of the, um, uh, of the directive. Uh, we estimate it at around uh, 10%, uh, but 10%, um, that 10%, uh, creates um, an impact of 40 to 50 percent on our asylum flow because those third country nationals um, they are directed towards the the asylum flow huh? uh, they go to to ask for asylum and they enter the regular reception system the regular reception system that was already on big pressure um, that had occupancy rates of 95 96 percent and the reception centers we planned to open, let's say, for the regular asylum flow, are being used now to house uh, Ukraine um, nationals uh, who fall under the directive and who are waiting to go to the local municipalities or to the provinces. But these are the, the places we are now lacking um, in, the, in the regular reception flow. So one of the big challenges we're facing now is that going from uh, one uh, asylum and reception crisis that we had the last months where we were um, uh, constantly searching for places and, and really on the limit of, of our occupancy rate is trying to manage two reception crises uh, at the moment, namely um, people who are uh, being registered under the temporary protection directive and where we have big waiting lines before the offices, uh, the new offices we made in Brussels, and we are now planning to move to new offices uh, next Monday, where we can host uh, more people, and managing um, a, a reception and asylum crisis in front of our regular gates, where uh, we we have we have a lack of uh, a lack of places. Um, so this is really. Um, from our side, um, I think uh, a big uh, challenge. Um, on the other challenges, I will come back um, later. So I can give the floor to the other people. Okay, thank you, Susan. Thank you. Um, Kadri, um, could you give us um, an insight from the humanitarian perspective? Uh, is it helpful to activate the directive? Which challenges do you see? Thank you so much. Um, so my name is Kadri Sova, as, as I've been already introduced, I'm not going to spend time on that, but just to say that the Red Cross EU office represents the national societies um, of the EU countries, as well as Norway and Iceland, um, and the IFRC, which is the International Federation of Red Cross, which is broader and international uh, federation. Um, so I think a lot has been said already, um, you know, from from our perspective, obviously, it's a huge, important step. Uh, it's a very positive step. Um, it also shows, you know, how how much solidarity there actually can be in Europe um, for, you know, people fleeing, um, and kind of, you know, going forward as well to see, like, how can we, how can we tap into that kind of um, response, you know, going forward as well to other conflicts, to other situations. Um, so it's a it's a big step. It's you know the, the positives have been mentioned already, you know the quick access I think to status um, that also um, enables people to access structural assistance and, and structural systems uh, in 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 the country, and also relieves um, the first line 
assistance, uh, you know, from, from kind of giving that direct humanitarian help. As you can imagine, you know, the neighboring countries are, you know, completely overwhelmed um, with responding to the first needs of people. Um, so, and we see that now people are making their way and already arriving to other countries in Europe, which is great. And um, this is just unfolding, you know, at the moment. So what we, um, what we see with our national societies is, as well is that they're now um, talking to their governments about the implementation of the directive, you know, what that actually means, having those conversations. Um, and also the commission is still preparing guidelines um, on two member states on how to, how to implement the, the directive, which we're also hoping to, um, to, to engage uh, with the commission on those as well. Um, I think it's that I think that the two big pro problems or issues uh, going forward is housing and schooling. I think that's, um, you know, even with all the solidarity and best will, they're very tricky things to 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 actually, uh, um, you know, enable access to. Um, so I think these will be like two big, big things that, that countries will have to deal with. In terms of the temporary um, protection directive itself, I think there's more questions and answers. I won't kind of go into all of those questions, but maybe just some that are, you know, the most most burning. I think for um, for our network. Um, so so it's been mentioned as well the kind of what's what's happening with the third country nationals. Um, I think even those third country nationals that have long term permits and can prove um, that the existence of permits. There's also this additional clause about. Um, you know, uh, it, um, only if they're unable to safely return to their country of origin, and I think that's a big, big question mark. Like, what what does that actually mean? Does this mean that um, what where's the burden of proof? Is it similar to the asylum process? You know, do you really have to? Um, you know, is 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 that proce process? Who's going to assess it and how? Or you know, is there a relaxed procedure or a bit different procedure that's considering also? Um, you know, individual circumstances. Um, I think that's that's that has come up uh, a lot also, in particular with the Russian nationals. There's a huge group of um, of Russians um, living permanently or long term in Ukraine. So, what's the kind of additional political layer there as well in terms of determining, you know, is Russia a safe place for them to return now or not? So, I think that's definitely a big. Uh, a big issue. And then um, as well, um, the people that don't fall under the directive, um, I mean, undocumented migrants, for example, there is a, a possibility, you know, a humanitarian grounds to allow ac access to the EU territory. But what then, like what will happen to those people? Um, how do we make sure that people who are traumatized by war and fleeing are not detained, for example? Will people um, you know, who, who aren't covered by the directive, will they have access to asylum procedures or other residence permit uh, procedures? Um, and then finally, um, there's also the question around, I think it's also been mentioned kind of the, the, the two tracks of like um, the international protection and applying for asylum, which is allowed under the directive. You can, you can apply for asylum, but then um, would you be then kind of uh, the entitlements would fall back to the asylum seeker level, or can you retain the entitlements guaranteed under the, the protection directive? Um, I think that's that's another question. I mean, the directive does foresee that if you are not granted asylum, you still retain the temporary protection status until you know it kind of runs out. Um, but yeah, I think these are some of the the the, the key questions. That we have, and the concern is indeed with the third country nationals um, at this moment. Yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you. Um, yeah, I just collected the latest data from uh, UNHCR, and according to that, at least 2.3 million people have fled Ukraine since the 24th of February. And as so many people need assistance at the same time, uh, practitioners on the ground will have to prioritize and therefore they probably conduct some kind of vulnerability assessment. Uh, Luke, would you like to jump in here and share with us your thoughts on how these assessments can be facilitated 
also based on the findings of the Walnut project. Yeah, uh, th thank you, Suzanne. But first, uh, you, you're very right to, to underline the numbers because I think uh, the, the situation is quite different from the one we've been studying uh, so far as part of our project. I also had a look uh, at the data from uh, the BAMF, uh, the Migration Office here in Germany, uh, regarding the uh, Yugoslav wars, so the, the wars in Yugoslavia. And this was the last time, you know, there was some kind of uh, temporary protection scheme uh, that were organized at national level, not at EU level. And during this conflict over 10 years, uh, 4 million people fled. So 4 million people over 10 years, That's, these are numbers that are completely different uh, than uh, the numbers we're facing now, where we have a, a much higher, almost as high a number of people uh, that fled in uh, only uh, two uh, weeks. This is simply to say that, uh, of course, our findings uh, were, were made in a different context and, and, and we need to be cautious when, uh, uh, when trying to, to look at the situation now based on our finding. Still, I think there are some uh, things uh, that stand out and that are still uh, relevant. There are some overall lessons uh, which uh, can tell us and which can maybe show uh, one of the way forward uh, when dealing uh, with uh, the influx uh, we're currently facing of people uh, who have uh, to flee. And one of these lessons uh, is indeed that uh, it's a very human thing to do, but when confronted to uh, a wide number of people, uh, what, do what do practitioners, what do state actors do on the ground? Well, they try to prioritize their work and they do so on a kind of uh, intuitive assessment of who's the most vulnerable. And that's a finding we've had. And I think uh, this will become even more important in this current context where numbers are becoming higher. Is it something uh, we should be worried about? Well, so far research shows that it's, it's not necessarily uh, the case. Uh, it's uh, to the contrary quite important to leave a certain leeway to the state actors on the grounds, to the practitioner, uh, to adapt their practices uh, so that they can answer to the actual needs, uh, so that they can adapt uh, the state uh, response, uh, so that they can, if needed, give some priority uh, to uh, the most vulnerable people uh, with uh, the, uh, who have a very uh, specific needs that need to be uh, urgently addressed. But what our findings also show is that there are some dangers to this. Uh, uh, and this can uh, only work, actually, you can only go into the direction of uh, into actually improving the protection needs of those who are in the most vulnerable uh, position uh, if you create a system in which uh, decent living conditions are guaranteed to everyone. That's the first uh, condition that needs to be met if you want to have this kind of vulnerability assessment that will reach the goals of indeed protecting those who are in the most vulnerable position and to address other specific needs. Another conclusion we could draw is that uh, you need to uh, have an approach that remains connected uh, with migrants' experiences. If it's too intuitive, especially facing uh, a wide number of people who are uh, facing very difficult uh, living condition, you end up in a situation where the answer uh, that's being given by the state is a stereotyped answer. It's based on the stereotype that uh, people may have on the ground on uh, what the main life challenges of those people uh, seeking uh, protection uh, might be. And if we don't meet this condition, first, guaranteeing decent living conditions to everyone, and second, having an approach that really considers what their main challenges are, how they perceive their main challenges, how they perceive these migrants and these uh, uh, people benefiting now from the temporary protection, their own needs, then uh, we end up in a situation that has been documented uh, by some of our teams, uh, uh, for example, in the context of Ganda, uh, where you have a very fierce vulnerability competition that emerges, uh, which is a kind of competition uh, in which uh, people will try to frame themselves as being most vulnerable, as being more vulnerable than others, because that's kind of uh, the only way uh, to a uh, survival. And of course, this kind of competition has a lot of negative effect on those who are actually the most vulnerable because they're too traumatized, uh, they're not able, they don't have the means uh, to uh, compete uh, in this competition. But on the other hand, uh, if we keep uh, this uh, focus on guaranteeing on the one hand, distant living condition, and on the other hand, uh, being attentive to uh, the protection needs as expressed and as experienced uh, by uh, the migrants themselves, then uh, we might have a way, we might have a go uh, towards developing state responses uh, that allow to actually address uh, the uh, specific needs uh, that uh, come up. 
Now, of course, I, I realize it's a bit abstract. What could that mean uh, in practice? I think one thing it could mean, and that's something that has been raised uh, by a few speakers uh, before, uh, is that, for example, when you speak about children, uh, you should also uh, consider that there needs to be some kind of access to education because they have this additional specific need uh, that needs uh, to be addressed. And I think it's something that should not be forgotten uh, in the context of the, the implementation of the temporary protection directive, because it's not because the protection status is a temporary one, that it's a protection status for one year, that this other protection needs uh, should not be uh, considered, uh, given how vulnerable these people are. I'm thinking again uh, of these children, some of them have been through uh, very traumatizing uh, experiences. Uh, but also because uh, there is still a lot of uncertainty uh, at this stage on how the situation uh, will evolve and on how the situation will be for these people who apply uh, for, for temporary protection now uh, in uh, a year. Uh, thank you, uh, Suzanne. The floor is back to you. Thank you. Um, well, when I, I'm, uh, I'm based in Berlin and uh, I see, uh, of course, those pictures of um, so many people coming here to the train station, for example, and I see a huge wave of solidarity. Um, many people offer goods and places to stay. And um, of course, I'm not the only one reminded of um, 2015 when I'm looking into the questions in our Q&A section. I will come to that in a second. But first, I'd like to ask uh, Zainab, um, maybe you can give us an insight on what lessons we have learned from that time, from 2015, that will help us to, uh, to cope with the current uh, situation. Yeah, thank you very much, Susanna, and thank you for all the other speakers so far. It has been super interesting. Um, yeah, I'd like to give some insights on the basis of some of the academic studies as well that has been conducted on the situation of 2015 and what it seems like we have learned and what uh, can be done better. Uh, and I'm going to um, maybe sometimes also repeat some of the things that's been mentioned and put it in the context of 2015. I'll start with this study that was just mentioned in the beginning, namely the study that I coordinated from 2017 to 2020, where uh, uh, we worked together with Luke as well. This was a Max Planck Society uh, initiative, um, where we specifically looked at the uh, situation of summer of migration um, in Germany, but also generally in Europe. And one of the major findings that we had that seems very banal, but also very important is that um, also because of the, all the alarming bells about this being a huge crisis is that the administration did not collapse. They, it actually managed to uh, receive all these people, create solutions, um, and also in the process sometimes as well, actually institute some reforms into the structures that would then now help us be quicker in, in our response mechanisms. Of course, this was not everywhere, but in general, I think we can, we can say that we managed to sort of uh, receive this process. Um, and of particular importance here was, of course, the role of the local level in the reception uh, efforts that, that needs to be, that can be not be underlined enough. I would say the role of civil society, but also willingness of some of the municipalities that really came forward in this process. Um, so what went down under this rubric of welcome uh, culture, so becomes culture in German, was an immense mobilization of large parts of the population. Um, and ever since, actually, municipalities and civil society actors have continued to come forward for the reception of refugees, even when the politics shut the doors for, for this, for instance, in uh, March 2020, when um, more than 4,000 migrants were uh, stranded in the Greek-Turkish border, we had campaigns in Germany saying, we have a plot, we can get this, take, take these people, but the politics didn't allow for it. So what we now see in the Ukrainian situation is that some of this infrastructure are actually really still in place. So we don't start from scratch, which is, which is a good thing. Um, and studies conducted at the time already has shown that there's a potential for um, this movement for people's engagement to be more sustainable. Um, and we have seen that the people who have been engaged at the time remained engaged to this day. Um, as you might know, we have um, um, in uh, the last week, actually, with an impressive speed conducted, I mean, my colleagues at Detson conducted a survey, um, and they found out that 90% of the German population was for taking in uh, Ukrainian refugees into German territory. Half of the population said they could um, see themselves donating or volunteering for, for this. 
and one fourth actually showed willingness to offer accommodation in their own houses. So this is already, this offers us a very good basis to start the reception process. What is different, what we did not have in 2015, and that has been said already by uh, some of the other panelists, is um, the existing diaspora. This is a huge asset that will help uh, the process. Um, in Germany, we have about an estimated 300,000 people of Ukrainian origin. Um, of course, this is not a comparatively a smaller community in Germany, but it has become particularly organized um, after the Maidan protests and the insights from the field um, that we hear now that they're heavily involved in the voluntary action. For neighboring countries, this is even more the case. We know that in Poland, um, an estimated about a million Ukrainian citizens used to live in the country and they've been very much at the front lines of the voluntary actions right now. Um, but at the same time, I also do not want to offer a very rosy picture of what happened in 2015 and particularly also afterwards. Um, we know that the, um, despite the societal engagement, which was also a bit uneven across and even within European states, the political rhetoric has deteriorated significantly. Restrictive policies have been put in place, uh, not that just in Germany, but also at the EU level, um, externalization policies have been steering the ship, particularly uh, with the deadlock of the uh, common European asylum system that did not come up with mandatory solidarity mechanisms. These were not developed. So a lot of focus has been put on externalization. Uh, we have seen legitimization of pushbacks, criminalization of solidarity movements and search and rescue missions. And we have some increasing investments in offenses and uh, borders, border defense. So we have failed to offer a, a systemic reaction when Afghanistan shattered, allowed huge blows to our protection systems in the Belarusian Polish border, just four hours away from where we are now offering compassion and warm welcome. At the national level, we have invented this concept of uh, prospect of stay, which is Bleibe perspective in German which basically gives differential rights um, and access to resources to asylum seekers. So these all serve to sort of uh, reinforce the binary conceptualization of bogus asylum seekers versus um, real refugees and that pitted them against each other and allowed them to have different deservingness frames attributed to them. And now in these moments, of, of like the moment that we are unfortunately undergoing, these frames become uh, crystallized. And we have seen um, you know, appalling racialized examples, both in media reporting, but also in the initial, at least, border practices. So coming back to what has been said by also um, on the vulnerability, who's more vulnerable, but also the, um, you know, what um, Kadri raised, Martin raised about double standards, about the situation of undocumented people. So this is really the kind of people and situation that we should not lose sight on for the moment. Um, so moving forward, what we need to prioritize again, I think I won't be oh, all that original after all these good uh, panelists, but put the people in the center stage, regardless of their nationality, race um, and ethnicity, and try to avoid legal limbo to the extent possible, as we have seen that that is detrimental for future perspectives. So here, um, again, mentioned the one year remit of the directive uh, is uh, not less than ideal. Um, and similarly, I think we need to think now and not later now about longer term pathways and prepare for the very real possibility of the situation turning into a protracted conflict. Um, again, here, um, uh, Hannes pointed out that we are actually only maybe postponing the asylum process um, temporarily, as mentioned also by Martin. And I think in order to do that, we need to better coordinate civil society and state initiatives, uh, which has been also mentioned um, by Michael. And I do think that this is to a certain extent is actually happening in places like Germany, where we have been through this experience of 2015. Again, some of the structures are in place, uh, particularly when it comes to accommodation. I think this is happening, but we need to think of this again long term and particularly the role of diaspora here um, and include them in the process of reception. Um, and think of the ways where we can create opportunities for daycare, um, for schooling, you know, also the, given the characteristics of this population. And then finally, we need to also achieve a better EU solidarity. Uh, that's, that's also one thing that we did not manage very well in 2015, so that, that we, need, we need this now. 
um, but also taking into account people's autonomy and agency um, here. And here I really, really welcome um, the council decisions emphasis on the ability of Ukrainian citizens to um, sort of choose the member state in which they want to enjoy the rights attached to temporary protection and to join their families and friends and throughout the diaspora networks. Um, and this has been so often frowned upon for other uh, asylum seekers um, to the extent of discrediting their um, asylum claim. So, I mean, I try to be optimistic here, and I also take this as a lesson learned from previous experiences, and we'll see how it will be implemented. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and as I said, um, I want to bring to the floor some of the questions from the Q&A section. And there's also um, a person um, who's wondering why in 2015, 2016, um, this um, temporary protection directive was not triggered. Um, Hannah, would you jump in here and explain or share your thoughts on that? Yes, thank you, Susan. I think that's the question uh, that many have raised. I think in that respect, it's quite important to understand that this mechanism is a procedural device. So it's very different from other parts of the kind of um, EU asylum uh, key. So the, the, the group of EU laws that we have available, uh, the qualification directive, for example, outlines the two EU harmonized protection status that we have, and that's the refugee status and also subsidiary protection. What this procedural device does is it um, allows the member states to trigger this in case of a mass influx that would undermine the common European asylum system. So when we did the study in 2015 for the commission, we looked at other cases where it could have been triggered and where member states like Belgium in this case asked for um, the mechanism to be activated. And so it was really interesting when we looked at, for example, the Arab Spring, where we also had a really significant rise in arrivals um, several member states from the Southern European states asked to, to activate it. And it didn't go ahead because we need, as you know, now qualified majority. At the time, what was thought is that it was an, a limited number of member states that were affected. And there was an idea that it would be better to support the situation in a different way. So in 2001, we didn't have the European Asylum Support Office, which is now the EUAA. We didn't have those kind of operational support plans that they now offer. Uh, and so in a combination of support from the EASO, financial instruments, for example, through AMIF, those situations resolved. In 2015, again, there were a number of countries who came forward to ask for the activation at the time. And I think there, there's a different thing that comes into play. As we said, it's a procedural device. It needs political approval, but it was also uh, triggering a concern that it may act as a pull factor, that it would attract further people who, for example, were in Lebanon and Jordan and other places to come to the EU. I think there's a different situation that we have today when Ukrainians flee their country and they cross the border, they actually land into the EU unless they go to Moldova and other places. And I think that's the biggest thing. We know this will exert pressure on our systems, whatever we do. And hence, this procedure device was kickstarted. So that's basically what they've told us at the Thanks. Um, we have also two uh, quite practical uh, questions, I'd say. Uh, Dominic Legrum for, uh, asks, what happens if Ukrainian refugees do not want to leave, for example, Poland, and will they forced to re uh, will be forced to relocate? Um, I'm not sure whether Martin maybe can answer that question. Yeah, I mean, I, I try. Um, I, basically, uh, with relocation, we don't know yet, actually. I think I'm, I'm, I'm actually worried the other way around. Will there be relocation from countries? Uh, and will this work um, that uh, people are also relocated to other countries in a, in a, in a sense of, of um, solidarity and responsibility sharing? Um, uh, no, it should not be that uh, they are relocated um, uh, against their will. Uh, it's actually explicitly in the in the directive uh, that is not only um, uh, that there's a relocation, but there must be also an agreement by the by the uh, um, uh, Ukrainian who should be relocated. Uh, so I, I I don't think that this would be the case. Okay, and another question is whether there is any specific work permit for refugees coming from Vijay Kumar Mishra.
Martin? Yeah, I mean, uh, this is one of the things that I pointed out. We will have to see how it will develop at national level in, in, in each country. Uh, it's not yet said. I mean, refugees uh, don't, uh, if they are recognized, uh, they usually don't need a, a, a work permit, a special one. There's still a hierarchy uh, of first uh, EU uh, member states to be uh, on the labor market. Uh, but uh, this will be one of the things that I tried to, to, to point out at the beginning, where there might be some, some different um, rules now to be to be done in, in member states and we need to see how this will, will work out. And um, probably I, I just take the liberty to have one more point uh, because it was mentioned before about vulnerability and, uh, and about networks. I think there's also one thing that we also might need, need to keep in mind. Those who come now and usually those who come first, they have the strongest networks. Um, and um, the people that come a bit later that we, we know from, from, from other contexts, they might be without networks and they might be special vulnerable. So this is just I wanted to point out because we uh, praised quite a, a few times now the, the, the importance of networks. Thank you. Um, uh, Michael, I, um, uh, I remember that you wanted to add some more um, challenges uh, uh, during your talk. I know that we only have a few minutes left, but maybe you want to pick up on that. Thank you, Suzanne. Well, I, I think a lot of a lot of things have have already been been uh, been mentioned. Uh, there is the whole logistical side, uh, building up the the capacity, uh, initial reception, uh, reception within the regions, etc. I think an enormous challenge is um, is everything afterwards. That uh, once people have have housing, um, even if temp in temporary shelters, is how to get those people into regular apartments, uh, labor market, education, etc. Um, perhaps another challenge is, is what you see is that there is an enormous drive within civil society and there's enormous goodwill at the moment, uh, but this is also um, something, this could also be a threat um, and uh, a crisis which is not well managed can, can quickly turn into or give, give negative feelings. Say, remember what happened, I think, at New Year's Eve in, in, in Kulun, Cologne, um, where, where the atmosphere towards uh, and re, the, the, the receiving uh, climate towards Syrian refugees quickly changed. So I think we should be aware of that also. We, we did there the, the, the call for support for civil society and, and civilians, and a lot of people responded to that. Um, that can quickly also change into something else. So we should be aware of that. And this also puts a lot of responsibilities onto the competent authorities to create well-functioning procedures, uh, good communication information streams, um, so that people really know what to expect and, and, and how to, um, to manage. Um, what we mentioned also is a little bit of difference at the moment between real um, refugees and asylum seekers um, who come from real war zones, I put it between brackets, and the other ones. Um, you see a shift in, in the way there has been, the, uh, we speak about uh, Ukraine uh, refugees as being, and literally yeah, from political sides, and not only extreme right, um, there's been, the, the discourse uh, at the moment is, is, these are real refugees. We see that they come from a war situation. So, Let's be careful there also, because also the the uh, what can say the, the 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 elements that are being granted towards the Ukraine uh, refugees uh, differ also from from the regular asylum uh, seekers. Um, so be aware that we don't create um, two categories: uh, the class one and the class two uh, refugees. Um, with different types of, of advantages or, um, or elements they are entitled to. So, um, and, and, and the last one I quickly wanted to state is, is there is also uh, that, that, that impact of third country nationals uh, who don't fall under the temporary protection directive, but have also a huge impact on, um, on the regular asylum uh, system. Um, and I'll leave it here because I have to go also. 
Thank you. Um, yeah, we are also already at the end of uh, our short webinar, uh, short on short notice. So thanks to all of you that you took the time to, to come here to share your knowledge, uh, which is very much appreciated. And also short in time, because of course, uh, we've more or less touched the surface of everything. We could talk quite long, but I think uh, we've managed to give um, a great uh, or a broad perspective on uh, different issues and, and um, obstacles or challenges that we are facing. So uh, thank you very much to all of you.